Hi, this is towards a field of collaborative education research, a collaboration between the Reshape Network and the Collaborative Education Research Collective. My name is Ari Hack. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. Hi, everyone watching this video. My name is Wade Berger. I'm a PhD candidate at Northwestern University. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Muller. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlie Mahoney, a PhD student at the University of Washington. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula Arcetrigati. I'm the director of the National Network of Education Research Practice Partnerships, or NERP. And I'm also here on behalf of my close colleague, Laura Wentworth, who is director of the Research Practice Partnership Program at the California Education Partners. The Reshape Network is a collaborative of early career scholars and graduate students who are focused on um, enacting anti-racist, equitable, and transformative community-driven partnerships. This mission is supported by four broad goals, which we, we have here on the slide. The Reshape Network has been around for a number of years um, in and invo involves graduate students and early career scholars across universities across the entire country. And the, and, and the main focus of this network has been to look at how we as a network can support each other in developing collaborative-based research um, when our home institutions, our, our graduate studies, the courses that were, are available to us may not have all the tools or ideas that we need to enact collaborative research within our um, early career research practices. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Paula and I, I direct the National Network of Education Research Practice Partnerships or NERP. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of this framework that we're going to share in a couple slides from now. Um, it all started from a convening that was hosted by our, a sister organization to ours um, called the National Center for Research and Policy and Practice, who brought together several universities across the US that were already engaged in different forms of collaborative education research to come together to kind of a summit um, to try to understand what do folks that are going through graduate training programs, what might they need to um, engage in to be prepared to do this kind of work um, post-graduate school. So this actually part of the origin story of Reshape. Reshape started in some of those conversations there. So it's a really nice kind of circling our way back. Um, so that was back in 2019. Some folks picked up that conversation after that convening and kept it going. Um, so some of those institutions that are listed on this slide, Stanford, CU Boulder, UC Irvine, Northwestern. And so coming together, NERP then came back on the scene um, as well. I was at that original uh, 2019 convening, but then I also joined with some of these folks that were continuing to think about this. And we wanted to make it a little bit broader than just graduate students, because if we think about the whole ecosystem of folks that are potentially um, engaging in collaborative education research, it involves many folks from different organizations um, and roles. So um, that was sort of one, one kind of direction change that we made a little bit is to expand um, the audiences that might contribute to what a framework would be um, with respect to supporting people that want to engage in collaborative education research. So we went through a whole bunch of design sprints um, through a whole through, through several different instances um, that resulted in an in-person meeting where we brought together ideas from all these people that joined in on these various um, virtual uh, convenings that we had. And the idea was to come out with some kind of framework that was collaboratively developed. So we, um, the whole process that we engaged in with respect to building this framework was also collaborative in and of itself, um, trying to engage folks from all different sectors of the education space. And that was on purpose because we do really believe in collaborative education research. We do believe that it's different. We do believe it's important and that is the way to, to kind of move forward. So that was our process. That's how we got there. So what you're seeing here on this slide is the cover of the white paper that we produced um, with this collaborative. So we ended up making a name for the group and that, that's what you see there, the Collaborative Education Research Collective. And within the first few pages, you'll see several authors listed. And that is really to honor and recognize and acknowledge the many voices that are represented in this framework. The other thing that's cool about this framework is that it does, represent and you will see when when you look in the framework 
Um, there are different dimensions and features of many different ways to partner in this space. So there's a we think there's a wider family of approaches that can fall perhaps under this this um, this theme of collaborative education research. One thing that perhaps holds all of these uh, traditions together is for sure uh, a disruption of the status quo, um, a need to, to shift power dynamics, a, a need to raise voices that typically have often not been included in research endeavors. And so al although these different approaches might come to the table a little bit differently, they do feature a lot of these elements in their work. And that's kind of what it ends up, ends up getting reflected in the framework, which is really cool. So it's a little bit like a, a bridge between different um, collaborative approaches that one might see in education research. There's a link there to the actual framework. So we're gonna take the next two slides to give you uh, just a very brief overview of what you will find in the paper, but we do encourage you to go to that link and read the paper in its entirety. We talk a little bit more about our process and how we got to this framework and then the framework itself, as well as some case studies on how you might use the framework. Now we get to the main event, the framework. And there's five dimensions in this framework. So these are five ways that uh, you can kind of think about the extent to which education research is collaborative or not. And it's also an invitation to think critically about each of these dimensions. The first dimension is really focused on systems. So cultural, historical, political context, and the way that these more global contexts are affecting things that are happening more locally within a particular research context. Then we're talking about relationships. And these can be both interpersonal and intrapersonal. Intra meaning kind of reflecting within oneself and thinking about how external relationships show up within an individual person. Then inter interpersonal relationships are thinking about uh, kind of uh, roles and relationships that are external and how those can be affected and change over the research process. It's also important to consider resources, all the different resources, whether those are financial resources, whether that's time, whether that's people's expertise, um, the built environment, and the degree to which those resources are mobilized, and how those resources themselves have been shaped through powered relationships. And the final dimension of the framework is actually thinking about educational research itself and the context through which research may have been carried out in the past. Um, and uh, whether it's adaptive to local needs or whether it's actually something that's serving its own end. You know, is it just stuck in the ivory towers or it's a, something that's actually called for by the community and it's something that's gonna be helpful for them. So now we extend the framework uh, across past and future and really thinking about the temporal dimension. So all five of these dimensions exist in time. So we show up as researchers within the present moment, but really there are these long histories of research itself, of relationships, all of these dimensions that have existed within a given context or research site. And in order to do collaborative education research well, we really need to understand those histories because those are gonna directly affect the ability with which we're able to do research, how that research is understood within local context and the effects that it can have. And then moving into the future, you know, all research is really future oriented. And for scholars like us who are really committed to justice centered research, you know, we're thinking about uh, what kinds of change we're trying to make, what kind of social transformation uh, and how these individual dimensions might be contributing to that change in a good way, or might actually be perpetuating some of these injustices that have existed historically. Of course, you know, this is going to be different depending on the research context, so it's a little bit difficult to talk about it in a really abstract way, but the purpose of this framework is to be abstract enough so that different researchers can apply it to their own context. And then next, we're actually going to explore a specific example, which can hopefully provide a bit more clarity. I'm going to share with you an example of how you can apply this framework into your collaborative research. And while we recognize that this framework can be used for new collaborations that you are embarking upon, this is also very relevant to existing partnership work that you are working on doing and would like to move towards a more equitable distribution of power within. And this example from the Steminist project actually started back in 2015. 
It was a partnership between our local university and an after school program that was dedicated um, to empowering young girls and non-binary youth to pursue their dreams. And we specifically focused on science and um, interest in science, developing science identity and feeling like they had a sense of belonging on a university campus. So with the onset of COVID and the, the shutting down of our program, we were given an opportunity to really reconsider how we were approaching this collaborative research in order to make sure that we were centering around the community rather than our university needs. And so looking at that framework is a really useful way to reconsider our collaborative partnership work. Um, so I'm going to talk about three aspects of the framework here, um, noting that all five aspects are, are considered, but for time purposes, um, these are the, the top three that we really drove home in our programming. So starting with interpersonal relationships, um, this program was started to reach youth who are underrepresented in STEM fields. However, towards the end of our programming, we realized that their needs weren't necessarily being met. And we were focusing on what us as, as researchers in universities viewed as important to expose these youth to rather than driving our programming through their interests, right? So we really needed to create space for our, our youth collaborators and specifically our teen collaborators who had been in the program for multiple years to come and have their voices shared of what was actually useful to them and how they would feel welcome in these university spaces when they came to visit our campus. The second area is resource mobilization. And while yes, we need to reconsider how we were um, leveraging our community and our university financial and, and physical resources, we also really needed to consider how we're using technology and addressing the need for digital literacy within our youth. Um, this program was established for students to collect data and publish a book, a physical book, uh, you can buy it on Amazon, um, to help increase general literacy. However, in this new modern world, our youth expressed an interest in digital literacy and really working with multimedia. And so we needed to figure out how we can use the resources available to us in order to give them access to these high quality um, technologies that would help them to create vlogs and video diaries that they were interested in creating. And lastly, in educational research, COVID-19 really allowed us to dive deep into how we were distributing power over our research agenda um, and publications. And we were actually able to do a small study on our research team to look at how we were fostering a sense of belonging um, for our undergraduate researchers, as well as look at how we were incorporating our youth co-learners in that data collection process. And through that little study, we were able to see areas that we, we should improve upon in this next iteration of the program, as well as areas where we were strong and really make sure to hold on to those um, sy systems that we have in place to keep inviting our undergraduate researchers as co-authors and co-publishers um, within the work that we're doing. And so just these three different places, interpersonal relationships, resource mobilization, and educational research, this framework really helped us to dive deep and ask really critical questions that are present in the framework to consider how we can improve moving forward. All right, so we've been talking about the framework, how it works, and what it looks like in our work, but now this is the time for uh, you to get involved in uh, engaging with the framework. And so what we're doing is we're showing you, uh, we've got the five dimensions of the framework on the screen. And what we want you to do is to pick one of the five dimensions that you can engage with and think about how it applies to your work. In order to do this, what we're gonna have you do is access the link on the screen under step two, that's tinyurl.com slash reshape CLS. That, go to that website. That's going to prompt you to make a copy of this very slideshow. And after this slide in the slideshow, it's going to have each one of these dimensions of the framework available for you to do some brainstorming. There's a list of questions to get you thinking about how the framework applies to you and the work that you do and to think a little bit more deeply about how the framework might apply to your work. Once you're done taking some notes and thinking through these questions, when we get together on October 26th, we'll have a great body of work to be able to come together and talk about the framework. We'll be able to share all the different ways that it connects to the work that you do, and it will be a great way to learn from each other. Thanks so much for watching our presentation. We will see you on October 26th at the Connected Learning Summit Showcase presentations. And feel free to reach out at any point. If you have questions, thoughts, this inspired something for you, my email address is on the screen there. 
It's arihawk at uw.edu.